Hello to everyone. Uh, thanks also go to Grant Valentine who can't be here today, but he was the one that got me in for this talk. He, uh, he made up the title and then I guess I had to put the slides around it. But fortunately it's something that uh, I sort of believe in. I think it's a good topic. It's something I like talking about. Um, so I'll talk about this and then I'll sort of link that to my, I'm not a very sentimental person, but I guess I'm 10 years out of uni, so I might as well include some of my reflections and learnings from the last 10 years. Uh, hopefully that's useful for uh, people who are doing the, the research and for people that have been in the industry for a while. Hopefully this uh, sort of resounds true with something you might already know and, uh, and hopefully some bits of new information in there as well. So what I wanted to talk through today is enhanced process technologies. But I'll, to provide some context or preface that, I wanted to talk to the goal, uh, which is more or less my understanding today of what we're actually trying to do, what's the objective, and why is the industry where it is, um, and, and how does that then feed into what we can do from here, which is enhanced process technologies. Then once we have those sort of technical solutions more or less defined, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about how to actually motivate change, how to enable these things to happen within client organisations, again based on some observations over the last 10, 15 years. So the goal, uh, I imagine there'll be quite a few people in this room that know of this book. Um, those that don't, I would suggest to read it. It's by a guy, Eli Goldratt, and he talks about his story through a manufacturing process on how to deconstrain an operation and, how to act and what the actual value drivers are. Um, it's something that isn't typically taught, uh, but it's very relevant, uh, particularly when you start to look at any problem. So I'd like to just touch on a couple of key points of, of this book and then talk to how it applies to minerals processing and how I've seen it play out, uh, and almost use this as a, as a tool to uh, then come to motivate change. I'll talk to you later in the, doc, in the presentation. So Eli Goldratt talks about a theory of constraints, and, and that is to say that every system has a constraint uh, but the objective for any business is to increase the throughput, reduce the inventory, and reduce the operational expense. And the context under which this is presented is a manufacturing plant, so it doesn't quite gel perfectly with the minerals processing plant, but it's not too different. Uh, there's uh, a few key points there on, on examples of, of throughput, but basically throughput is not tons through the mill as we would typically expect for a processing plant, it's actually what are you producing and at what rate. So how much metal are you producing? And, and really it's how much are you selling into the market is, is what you're trying to maximise. Your inventory is uh, work in progress sometimes for manufacturing, but for a minerals processing plant, it's capital infrastructure. How much have you spent on your plant? And you might argue that some work in progress stockpiles or things like that are inventory as well, and that may be an argument under some circumstances to reduce those. The third aspect there is operational expense, which you also need to reduce. Uh, in the case of minerals processing, it's typically the operating cost elements, mining, processing, everything that you need, stay in business capital, all those things that are um, op an operational expense associated with, with the operation. So it's relatively simple. Right, uh, pretty simple concepts, but their implementation um, and, and how to, I guess, optimise around that can be a bit, a bit tricky. So to bring this back to minerals processing, what is the goal as we, in terms of words that we normally discuss? Is it that we're trying to increase recovery? Is it throughput through the mill? Um, is it operating cost? Is it capital cost? How do we balance these things? Um, the answer is we don't want to look at any of them in isolation. Um, really the, the objective function um, is to optimise project value and I'm an engineer and like most people in the room I suspect you will enjoy optimising things, you get that sort of good feeling when you say yes you found the optimum, that's really what it has to come back to, project value, not, not any of the others independently. So by project value, um, this is worth talking about, what, what do we mean? So the project isn't the piece of equipment you're looking at or the, even the processing plant. It's everything that involves the whole operation. Um, it starts at the community level. It's all the, um, the investment that's gone into the deposit, uh, all the community stakeholders, uh, all the relationships, the mining uh, area, processing, tailing, storage, rehabilitation, through to the product and the market, uh, governments, 
communities. It, the, the project really has to consider everything as in as wider a net as you can possibly pass. Uh, and I think that's a good, that's where you need to start with any any project. Um, some of those things may fall away and not be relevant, but absolutely that's the project aspect it needs to start at a very wide level. And value, well how do we optimise value? NPV is one of a number of measures. Um, and uh, the, the formula is pretty straightforward for NPV, I won't go through that. But basically the important thing is it does allocate a cash cost, uh, so a value, a time value of money. And, and we are trying to optimise that in terms of project value. And what that means, coming back to Goldratt's topics, we're trying to maximise cash flow, which is maximise revenue, minimise capital cost, minimise operating cost. So now I just want to talk through exactly what that means for a plant from the perspective of a, someone who walks into plants and has to try and optimise them, or sometimes designs uh, greenfields projects from scratch. Again, maximise cash flow, maximise revenue, minimise capital and operating costs. I've got to put this in there, but I'm glad I did, because um, risk is an element that doesn't typically feature in this equation. And I, I presented a paper recently at the Taylor's conference, which all I did was I took the average failure rate uh, of Taylor's dams and then applied um, some metrics around costs to what uh, loss of containment might mean. And based on some high level examples, there is a significant cost that happens when you, um, that is associated with risks. They are, I would say, in my experience, not adequately addressed or included in financial optimization exercises. So there's a range of risks that cover environmental, social, community, a range of issues that generally are forgotten and optimizations are done without considering those elements. Now you don't need to have perfect numbers to proceed down any of these paths, but you need to start um, by at least considering them and working out a framework for considering them if we're going to optimize something. So to maximise revenue, what can you do? Increase the grade, increase the throughput, increase recovery, or sometimes you can increase product grade and, and achieve a higher payability. That's, uh, I think, reasonably straightforward. Uh, capital cost becomes a little more interesting. Um, and a, a revelation might be to some that you actually need to have a bottleneck in your process. And to some plant designers, uh, that's not even properly understood. Um, some companies go and add margins onto all equipment um, because it's seen as more robust or lower risk. We actually want to design to a bottleneck. We need every operation to have a bottleneck and we need that bottleneck to be the most expensive piece of equipment in the plant. And for a conventional copper concentrator, that's the milling circuit, saving walls. It may be for a heat bleach, the SXEW, or it might be for new projects, the filtration, which are at least as expensive as common use can be. By the same logic, the low capital equipment should never bottleneck the plant. It is, um, it's a crime, I think, to have a plant limited by a concentrate pump. Um, but that happens from time to time. Um, so everything upstream and downstream of the bottleneck needs to have excess design margin in it. And that's how you maximise value through your operation. And then if you tie that in with the smart mine design with mines and mill, you can actually bottleneck multiple sections of the plant at once. For instance, if you had hard ores that were bottleneck in common issue, you can mix that with high or low clay ores that might bottleneck tailings filtration. So there's, uh, or copper grades versus the uh, copper hand, uh, handling, concentrate handling for the market. So you can actually bottleneck a couple of things at once, but typically it's only one, and, uh, and that's where the focus needs to be from a capital perspective. When we design the plants, we minimise the margins for the high capital equipment for that very reason. So we do a lot of test work to make sure we don't oversize the key bits of kit. The other aspect that influences capital costs is where designs have too much bulk quantities. So unnecessary steel, concrete, or earthworks that don't add value to what we're trying to do. Um, so in, in our layouts, we, we really make a lot of effort to make sure we minimise those because they're not driving revenue, they're not, they're not optimising the value equation for the most part. And you can actually optimise these things to achieve a uh, good distribution between earthworks and civil costs, where I've been saying. And it's a pretty, uh, pretty significant story, and this is how significant it can be. Um, you can reduce 50 to 80% uh, concrete and steel just by 
designing plans properly. So again, focusing on the right things, focusing on that uh, value equation drives you to this outcome um, as, as a consequence. In terms of operating costs, again, reduced power, reduced water, reduced reagents and labour. Do all those things as long as they don't come at a greater expense or cost in terms of revenue or capital cost. So I think this sort of sets the context for how I like to look at any minerals processing plan. And, and I think more people uh, think along these lines. I, I think it's, it will help um, certainly achieve clarity or put different projects into perspective on what the outcomes really need to be and what they're driving for. So coming back to Goldratt's theory here, to maximise cash flow, it's a series of identifying constraints, exploiting those constraints, making sure that that constraint is adequately fed. For argument's sake, if you have a mill uh, that's your most expensive piece of equipment, make sure you keep the feed up to it and make sure you don't bottleneck it downstream. Elevate the performance of that constraint, optimise your mill, for argument's sake. Uh, and then if the mill's no longer the bottleneck, the bottleneck shift to somewhere else and you conduct the same exercise downstream. And this is approach, an approach to continuous improvement and driving value out of all operations. So if we look back over the last 120 years, how has this manifested itself through uh, the challenge? And the challenge has been uh, a massive demand for copper, which is reflected in our supply, uh, given prices more or less constant, and declining head rates. So there's a range of solutions that include technology changes and increases in economies of scale. And I don't necessarily want to split those because I think they are intertwined to a large extent. <coughs> um, basically, we've had the advent of froth flotation. We've had bulk scale mining, which has increased uh, economies of scale or allowed enabled higher mining rates. We've had uh, SXEW and heat bleaching come into the picture, which has enabled processing of low grade, uh, mostly oxide ores. Um, we might have some new technologies coming up that enable better leaching of sulfide ores as well for copper. Uh, and then the bottom graph just shows how gearless mill drives have developed over the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, you know, in 1990, a 10 or 12 megawatt sag mill was about as big as you can get. Um, we're up to about 28 megawatts now. So, uh, those economies of scale have helped reduce the operating cost, which is reflected in that bottom left graph. So again, coming back to the value <laughs> equation, what does it mean for different deposits and different grades of ores? So fundamentally, if you have high value material, high grades, or uh, platinum group elements, things, precious metals, typically those deposits are, are small underground not always, but you have a high value of ore and you can justify maximising recovery on that material. So you can afford to spend a lot on your recovery processing. And that's where uh, a metallurgist approach of maximising recovery is a really good way to go. Conversely, if you have lower value material, uh, think of larger and cut at lower grades, your mining costs are lower. Um, but the, through, the, the driver there to maximise value is actually to get the uh, throughput through the plant, maximise revenue, and reduce operating costs. And for these lower value ton, low, lower value per ton materials, this is where pre-concentration and a couple of enhanced process technologies come into the picture. So I'll, uh, I'll talk to these now just to, uh, yeah, most of the focus with these enhanced process technologies is on the lower grade copper ores by way of example, but some of them also apply to other deposits. So enhanced process technologies, it's collectively what we essentially call the emerging technologies that uh, are applicable to plant design optimization and the gold rat approach to deconstructing a plant. <coughs> We're looking to increase the plant head grades as we know them, reduce the energy, reduce the water consumption, and reduce the impact on tailings and the environment. Without going to the specifics of each of them, I just wanted to talk through what they generally try and do, uh, because they're the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle that then can be um, applied differently to different projects. The first part is making sure you understand what is waste and what isn't. Um, that includes ore tracking, grade control, tools, markers on 
um, benches when uh, to track where the tuber goes. Rejecting waste earlier is uh, really pre-concentration, um, which is critical to uh, adding value. It includes a range of things like fine sensing, great engineering, uh, which is screening to reject low-grade material. Uh, bulk or particle sorting, media plants jigging. Coarse particle flotation, also a method to reject material at coarse sizes. Really, the, the object, a lot of the value comes in this, this second point here. But really what we're trying to do is use heterogeneity at any length scale possible or any method that we can to try and reject material as early as possible. And that's really the objective of minerals processing. Minerals processing is often called as separating valuable material from their rules. But really, I think a better definition is a way to reject sub-value material as economically efficiently as possible. That's really what we're trying to do the whole way through a processing plan. I think that definition causes you to reassess how plants are designed and operating. Energy efficient processing, there's a range of technologies there, high intensity glassing, HBGR, uh, and even hydrometallurgical and bioprocessors. Any way that we can upgrade a, a product or material to final product faster. Uh, Jamison cells are a good example, but there's also some new uh, flotation technologies around that look to do that, increase rock washing. Dry processing, uh, tailings do watering and cryostacking can reduce water consumption. Various different leaching methods for coal and now copper, uh, sorry, for gold and copper. Uh, and anything to improve your final product rate. Then we step into a couple of other sort of technologies that are getting a fair bit of attention at the moment. Um, advanced process control is a good one. That can add some uh, maybe 5% value for argument's sake relatively quickly to, to throughput and, uh, and as well as recovery improvements. Remote operating centers, reducing labor costs and achieving better performance. And of course, we've got predictive maintenance uh, and increased economies of scale. So I wanted to talk through what an example of EPTs might look like uh, as applied to a conventional con copper concentrator. And for argument's sake, I've taken an operating cost breakdown for a, for a large uh, open cut copper operation. And I'm going to overlay that against what that cost structure might look like with enhanced process technologies applied. What I'm showing here is uh, we're mining 100% of the material. I've, I've ignored the waste that we're, we're rejecting, but arguably there's a strip ratio of three or four uh, waste that's already been removed uh, from, this, from this slide. We're looking at uh, about $8 to mine the material, another $9 to crush, mill, and float it. And we're, we're milling, crushing, milling, and floating all of it. We're then re grinding. Uh, about 10% of that material and floating it in the cleaners and then about 3% of that material we're spending um, time and energy to dewater it, dry it and ship it and sell it on the market. If we were to look at a circuit with enhanced process technologies, this is what it might look like and, th and this, this is what the operating cost structure might look like. We're, we might knowing that we're going to pre-concentrate and reject some metal along the way. We'll probably mine a little bit more. So let's say for argument's sake, instead of 100% of the mine tons, we'll mine 120% because we're not going to get all of it back. Uh, so we're going to pay a little bit more on the mining, the crushing, the pre-concentration. We might then apply a bulk sorting step or particle sorting to reject some of the mass at a, at a core size, primary crush size. Then we might do secondary crushing. We might send it through a jigging circuit or screening great engineering to then reject a little bit more mass. Uh, and as we go through, you can see that we're spending high costs on some, probably higher costs on total, but uh, on less of the mass. So the net result is, is a benefit. So we're looking to uh, coarse grind, and then say include coarse particle flotation, remill those tons, we're down to 20% of the starting mass by now, down to rougher floating and, and tailings, and uh, slightly larger re and cleaner flotation circuit than what we had on the previous slide, uh, and then to find a concentrate again. So, what is the actual impact of this? 
on, on the first inspection, you can see that we paid about $17.50 per tonne for the conventional circuit. And for the new circuit, we paid about $15 a tonne, a little bit less, but we've processed 120% of the material. So the overall operating cost, as it stands here, is similar. Um, and we've produced a similar amount of metal. So on first inspection, this doesn't seem to be a particularly great idea. It would be difficult to sell uh, to management. But the detail is we've reduced the total milling energy by 40%. We've deconstrained the main bottleneck in the plant by 60%. We can then expand the rest of the circuit at a pretty low incremental cost. Float cells, mining trucks, pumps. Some of these things may sound expensive, but compared to the bottleneck, they're less expensive. And so you end up with projects that have excellent financial returns uh, for this very reason. This is a bit of a pessimistic case. You can consider that that extra 20% of the tonnes can come for free, free in truck, maybe material that incrementally has gone to waste but could be brought into the process and processed efficiently. We've improved the tail stability because we've produced a coarse tail. We've improved rehabilitation. Our tail is down 75% smaller. Our water reduction is 50%, which some sites, by the way, are now paying $5 a cubic metre for water. So that would be at, at say 0.6 cubes per tonne, that's a, a couple of dollars as well in the operating cost scenario that I haven't included here, but can be very significant for the size of Chile. And then we've reduced the cutoff growth in this, in this exercise, um, increasing reserves in the mine life. So when you, when you apply this approach to the project, as I was outlining before, the, the outcomes are compelling and, and the motivation to go that way is compelling. But if you assess it on the wrong basis or look at it the wrong way, you might find that it's, uh, it, it doesn't look that great. So how do we motivate the change uh, within client organisations? And I guess over the last 10 years I've had some time just to witness this being done well and this being done badly. So I'd like to talk about what the key drivers are behind how you might go about convincing people that something is actually a good idea and hoping you can take that back to your research projects or, or whatever you have to be working on at the moment. So the challenge of any new technology is that most people don't know about them. That's the first problem. They're not widely known. They're not even well understood. Uh, sometimes they even get installed before they're understood how they, how they really work. The benefits can be tricky to define. If you look at the problem in the wrong way or optimise to the wrong thing, you can erode all the value that you intended to add in the first place. Or, you can, or it can drive you to focus on the, the thing that doesn't matter. You might be focusing on optimising a reagent, but it may not matter in this instance. There's technical risks, and mining companies are traditionally extremely risk averse. Uh, they're big operations and they have demanding shareholders. There's a lot of reasons for that. But anything that introduces technical risk is immediately seen uh, as a threat. Integrating new projects within the schedule and operational considerations of existing operations is difficult because the existing operations are complicated already. Um, I think Joe Pease gave a talk actually a couple of years ago where he was talking about his successes and challenges of implementing different technologies and he spoke to how they managed to achieve very good uptake of Bison mills and Jamison cells as a piece of equipment. But the approach of mine to mill, which is substantially lower capital cost, uh, was much more difficult to gain acceptance, even though it provided similar or better economic benefits. The reason that he highlighted there was those solutions and EPTs are in the same boat. They cross multiple organisational boundaries. And, and in that sense, those boundaries are horizontal and vertical. So they range from the operator at, uh, who's running the plant, who will have his two cents, in fact, he's probably got the most to say, he or she, uh, to the CEO, who also needs to have buy-in. So you have to engage at, at all levels. And then they also include a range of experts horizontally across multiple disciplines. And I, th I think we all fall into the trap of becoming experts in what we know and sometimes don't step back far enough to understand enough about mining or economics or the financials or um, geotechnical 
water management hydrology. You know, so there's a lot of uh, horizontal layers that we need to involve and get buy-in from for some of these technologies to, uh, to proceed. And then you've got consultants, engineers, equipment suppliers. So there's a lot of different parties that, um, and this is probably the, the main crux, the main challenge, I think, getting the buy-in across this range of people. And the organisations may not be sufficiently motivated. The most motivated organisations are the startups, um, I would say. Uh, after that is probably the companies that are very well developed, the companies like the Teslas or the Googles that have, have really challenged the way that their organised organisational structures are built up in a way that they're more flexible and nimble. Um, so for me, business as usual is good enough. I'll keep my job this year. The CEO knows what he'll get. He'll probably get his bonus. He's happy. Um, the current part of which which helps that is some some blinkering um, at times you would say where the risks are understated. So there's sometimes difficult to change if you haven't got the motivation. And so I just thought I'd put a few clients up just to get you thinking if you've had experience with uh, some of these before. It's important to understand the client and then understand how they work because the solutions that I've presented and the methodologies even that I've presented don't always gel within the organisational frameworks in which they operate. Sometimes they do and some are a lot better than others and sometimes even parts of the business uh, thinks in certain ways it's quite developed and other parts of the business is sort of quite constrained. So there's, a, there's a various different theories on this. This is one that I, I thought I'd show. And it talks to clients developing from being a creative startup. Basically you have a startup on the left and then a, um, a Tesla or Google is on the right end of, the, of this chart. And what happens is these companies as they develop go through different stages of change and different crises that force them to uh, restructure and rethink and, and change the way they're organised. At first you have, and in some of these things if you look through them you might have actually observed these behaviours before. Um, so the startup's just looking to make money straight away, he might be looking to come into a section of the market where there isn't currently competition because something's been tried in a new and different way so they can be quite accepting of new technologies. Then there's a focus on efficiency, how do we drive things to be more efficient, how do we make our truck fleet more efficient, how do we save 1% extra fuel, uh, how do we expand the market, it's a bit sort of blank or if you like, how do we grow the market, control the market, then how do we, at that point you sort of can have sites that are uh, decentralised, geographic potentially, maybe all the decisions are being made in, in multiple locations and there's not a, tech, a, a central technical services department that might own some of these things. Then you can sort of go through a, uh, a crisis of control where you find there's too much red tape, really we're not being efficient because we've got too much bureaucracy and then that can be broken down and you can finally get to sort of a, a state like, like Tesla. So if you're sort of stuck somewhere in the middle, we find those clients are the most difficult ones to work with. You're, you're stuck in bureaucratic systems, you can't make quick decisions easily, you can't make good decisions because you're a bit hampered by processes, um, the, the red tape that was set up to prevent making bad decisions actually stops you moving forward as well. So how do we motivate that within various organisations? Um, some it's more difficult if they're, if they're sort of stuck in the red tape bureaucracy it's going to be difficult without some wholesale change. But I think the first step is you need to identify the target. What's the carrot and what are we shooting for and what's the ultimate light at the end of the tunnel, if you like? Uh, what's the business case? And, and I think the best way to do it is to come back to, uh, unfortunately, as I like to say, but it comes down to the economics because that will get buy-in across all levels. Even though there are benefits um, around environmental, social and community, they're not always top of mind. Increasingly, they're seeing value added to them and you would have seen uh, the Church of England is now uh, threatening investor action based on poor tailing stand performance, so that's starting to actually become a financial driver. But really, 
the, the first step is to identify the business case. If you can demonstrate a strong business case and you can drag all the environmental and social benefits along with it, then you, I think that's a really powerful way to enact change, probably a stronger way than starting at the other end, uh, unless there's been a disaster recently and it's uh, been people's minds short term. So prove and demonstrate that business case, socialise and seek buy-in as much as you can, try and identify champions that are going to own it within various client organisations. Then once you've identified and got buy-in on where you want to get to, you often can't get there in one step. So you need to identify a pathway that you can take a series of incremental steps to achieve the end goal. And each of those needs to pay for itself, it needs to be a strong business case in its own right, and be manageable within a smaller subscript. So that you can lay out a pathway of, of how you actually get to uh, the ultimate goal. Work with the organisational systems to break down barriers. Uh, there's a little mantra I've shown here, listen, um, challenge, align, which is a little loop in itself. And uh, this is one that Greg sort of pushed through the business for a while now. So listen, challenge, align, uh, any topic or um, issue and then move on and trust and deliver it. Uh, so as long as you, you may not have to agree with everything but you do need to get to a point of alignment before you can actually move forward. So that's that's about ensuring you engage openly and align it at all the different levels. Uh, you have to identify the right people in the client organisations, passionate champions, people who are skilled uh, and supportive and then the opportunities and risks you need to clearly understand them Make sure that you uh, economically evaluate the risks as much as possible and then manage them as you move forward. And on the right here, I've included a photo of the, the KD SAG mill. So when it was installed in the mid 2000s, it was a uh, 40 foot mill, 20 megawatts. Uh, it was the biggest in the world by a reasonable size. That project we seem to have a lot of these things that are not dissimilar to EPTs. There were technical risks, there were challenges. Um, they managed to navigate through with the right people, uh, the right level of risk management. I've shown it as black and white, but it really wasn't that long ago. Uh, but it seems like it was a while ago because now 20 megawatt mills are a thing of the past, we're up to 28 megawatts. So time moves quickly. So I can see that you know, reflecting on the last 10 years of my working life, in 10 years' time, we might be looking at things like hydro floats, bulk sorting, particle sorting. Uh, this philosophy with a with a set of background, and uh, and that'd be really nice because that I think would mean success. Uh, hopefully, we're not still discussing how to break down organisational barriers. And the net result, I, I'm wary that this has sounded like a bit of a talk on economics. But um, at the end of the day, I do consider myself an environmentalist as well. And I do think back to sites that I've influenced or improved over the years, whether it be recovery or throughput or increased production, that that has actually resulted in a benefit to the environment. Uh, making operations more economic improves their ability um, to behave better socially. And some of these technologies coming up have genuine and obvious uh, improvements to the environment. Uh, so if we can uh, implement them, that would be fantastic. Uh, thank you, everyone.